What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, May 6th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Tesla battery uh, material supplier tops list of human rights abuses for second year in a row. Unbelievable. Next up, energy AI could drive a natural gas boom as power companies face surging electrical demand. We'll go over to G7 agrees to end coal use, but can it? We'll find out from that one. Next up, environmentalists ignore renewables waste. And finally, in our new segment, ban on Russian uranium could help U.S. build nuclear fuel capacity, according to officials. I'd like to know who those officials are. We'll then pop over and cover um, some stuff in the finance segment. Oil settles down on some weak U.S. job data, actually about lowest it's been in, in, in three weeks. Natural gas sees a little bit of a spike. We did see rig counts continue just to get hammered. I will then spend the majority of my segment talking about Exxon uh, closing the Pioneer deal, mainly as the FTC forces out Sheffield. You know, as I'll say, he got conned in this one. Um, we'll cover all of that um, from many angles, and then we'll finish quickly um, looking at EOG earnings, which, again, finds some interesting nuggets there. We will cover all that in a bag of chips, guys. As always, uh, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our buddies over there at Tesla. You know, Michael, when you're a you're a manufacturer and you've got some suppliers that are like using child labor in the Congo, I don't think that's a good list to be on. Tesla battery material supplier tops list of human rights abuses for second year in a row. Here's some quotes in here. The global push for uh, clean energy depends on materials used from solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and batteries. Unless companies take a stamp out to abuse, quote, we expect large companies like Tesla to use their leverage. This is one of the Congo minor companies yep. saying this. He goes, we expect Tesla to do it. You're the one hiring them. I, I It's... It, I, I there's so it. much that goes into this. I'll let you, I'll let you read a little bit more than I'll give my take. Um, I'll tell you the, the, there's more than 500 allegations of abuse going back to 2010. Here's another quote. We see the risk of abuses increasing as pressure to mine for new materials is also intensifying says Carolyn Avon, the center for natural resources researcher. Obviously we expect large companies like Tesla to use their leverage to influence the sector as a whole and not only but ask, but require that their suppliers are not committing human rights abuses. Um, there's, this brings up a whole can of worms, Michael. Is it because the world is being forced to go this way because they're trying to kill ice engines so that we abuse kids? I mean, which one, which way do you think on this? Well, I, I think the, I mean, I, this article does an interesting job of trying to shift blame from Tesla, who is the one buying the cobalt, to Glencore, who's kind of the main, the main company who they're ta who they're targeting in this article, right. talking about those five hundred individual abuses. Glencore, as we know, is one of the world's largest kind of energy trading companies. They've shifted really away from that energy trading side and are really a producer. <laughs> they have huge, huge coal um, manufacturing and coal plants where they actually go mine coal. We know they're they're thinking about in the, in 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 London. They're they're considering spinning that off and trying to see if they could maybe take that coal business and 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 make it part of the United States Stock Exchange. We'll see where that goes. I think this brings up an interesting question: Is who is liable? Obviously, Glencore needs to be providing the the requisite work you know they're, they're talking mainly that there's no water they're in zambia here or, or what it, it, it's uh sorry give me a second um where's the uh what country is this in this is in some country where they're basically saying hey we're not even they're not even giving us water You're, they're forcing us to right. work 12 hour days and we don't even have water which is pretty right. interesting. This is in Congo, Peru, and Colombia, um, specifically in the Democratic Republics of Congo. Workers there, and I'm reading now straight from the article, workers there reported to have little water or food while working long hours in sweltering heat. According to a Glencourt uh, spokesperson, the, the workers had access to as much water as they need from water stations and communal areas and emphasized the company's commitment to worker health and safety. Again, 
whose job is it? It's everybody's job. And I think that's where people swing it miss. They try to say, Tesla will say, well, it's Glencore's job. Glencore would say, well, it's the job of the people who are on. We're a little bit removed. We're maybe a passive investor. The answer but, is everybody is is responsible to make sure that if you're going to if you're going to hire workers and you're going to use workers you're going to make sure that they have a, a a decent working environment. I think the if if I had to put my finger on it I blame Tesla a little bit more than I blame Glencore cuz Tesla is incentivized to have Glencore give them cobalt which is known as the blood diamonds of batteries as cheap as possible. The cheaper right. they can get cobalt, the cheaper they can sell their batteries and their cars, and the more they'll be able to compete with some of the, the Chinese companies who we know don't care about human rights. So if if you've got to peg it one way or the other, I feel like Tesla pushing it off to Glencore is a little bit of a, let's just say, convenient for them. So they don't have to necessarily, it, it's like Apple. We know Apple is is involved with human rights abuses up and down their value chain, but what do they continue to do? Just push it off, just push it off. Tim Cook, Elon Musk, they're never going to Congo to look at this stuff. They're going to read a report and say, oh, we need to do better. But it's Glencore's fault. It's like, okay, maybe it is Glencore's fault, but Glencore is only responding to the incentives that you put in place. Remember, in a free market society, incentives matter. I agree. And here's where I think it's despicable is because our law uh, makers and our Congress people are going after the... Uh, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions for oil and gas companies, but yet they won't go to the uh, go the other way for human rights and child abuse. I think it's despicable. So, that's... yeah. Now you know, while Glencore hasn't necessarily been charged with human rights abuses, we do know that they agreed to pay one point one billion in fines in 2022, mainly on the fact of foreign bribery and market manipulation charges. So clearly there's something, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. And where there is uh, a politician in Ukraine, there is pay kickback. So let's go to the next one here. AI could drive a natural gas boom as power companies face surging electrical demand. This article was actually from CNBC, and I thought it was an outstanding article. There is a 3.5-minute video in there uh, where they're interviewing Toby over at EQT. He is an animal. I absolutely love Toby. Mm -hmm. He is a, a, a really, really cool cat. Here's where I think he brought up some fantastic uh, points. That is, uh, this, in order for, she was asked by, he was asked by one of the uh, people interviewing, and they said, well, what is driving next year's growth in natural gas? He said the strip pricing for 2025 uh, is going to be a dollar more than it is right now. Why? Because the amount of electricity that AI campuses and data centers are going to need is natural gas. Guess how much, Michael? 15 BCF a day is what they're going to be needing. That's 15, excuse me, that's 13 New York City, the size of those cities, amount of power. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a lot of natural gas demand just in data centers. It is. And, I mean, we know for the past 10 or so years, we've had fairly flat power growth in the United States. Wells Ooh. Fargo, according to this article, has come out and said electricity demand forecast is expected to grow by up to 20% by 2030, mainly due to the fact that these data centers need AI. Absolutely. And so I, I thought uh, Toby was very well articulated in there. And I was very pleased to see that it did come out on CNBC. So, 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 so question for you. Yes. So you're you're Amazon, you're Google, you're Microsoft, you're Meta. You're in, you're in those strategy meetings. At right. what point do you get into the natural gas business yourself? Um, that is an outstanding question. Um, and uh, I am now trying to articulate a point because we we just saw that Japan has been buying all the way through the value chain. We see that uh, Total Energy is buying all the way through the uh, value chain. So countries through their uh, 
companies that they own and are going through are buying all the way back through. Why wouldn't it make sense? Well, we do see Amazon buying nuclear reactors. It -hmm. would make sense. Uh, Total Energy bought all those natural gas uh, power plants in Texas. It does make sense to do that. And I think you bring up a fantastic point from the standpoint, Michael, they're going to have to protect their low cost power. Otherwise, data centers aren't going to be able to grow. Especially if you think prices are going to be drastically higher for natural gas, say in three to five years, does it make sense to go out? Now, as we're going to cover in a little bit, the FTC might have something to say about that, but I wouldn't be surprised if a company specifically like Amazon decided to maybe go scoop up a small natural gas producer that allows them to have unlimited access, quote unquote, to cheaper power because now they're only paying for transportation costs. I think it's interesting and and I wouldn't be shocked if there's if we hear some rumblings of some possible M&A activity specifically between some of these big data center players, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and some specific natural gas players, you know, depending on location. So I think it's super interesting, but it, it, the 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 shift of where of the balance of power is happening. I you could I couldn't agree more with you. And people have to protect their supply lines because supply line uh, link breakage has happened and will continue. Hey, let's go to the next one. G seven agrees to go to coal in coal, but can it? This is from Irina Slav, uh, the great Irina Slav, and it was on oil price if I remember right. Yes, this was on Irina Slav at oil price. Big thing here, the United States, UK, Italy, France, Japan, Germany, and Canada struck the deal to end use of coal for power generation by 2035. Holy smokes. Here's some big numbers, Michael. Coal as a power source in the G7 is 15% of the energy mix. Wow. This Now listen to this. When we come in here, uh, the G7... Uh, the bottom line. So it, let me read the just flat out read her last uh, paragraph here. So it's uncertain whether the G7 would give up coal completely, even the UK, which only generates a small portion of its electricity from coal, had to reopen a plant during a period of low wind power generation. But even if they do, however high the cost, this leaves the rest of the world, which would start using more coal not least because it would become cheaper, the net effect of the G7 coal phase out, if it ever materializes, may actually add to global emissions. Wow. What a great point to make on this. There is no realistic way that wind, solar, and nuclear could ever completely replace uh, oil and gas and coal. China will always purchase the cheapest form of energy, whether it's natural gas, whether it's wind, whether it's solar or whether it's coal. They're going to and buy the cheapest energy. So if we phase coal out to move to higher cost stuff, driving down the cost of coal, India, China, they're just going to buy more of it because they understand that cheap energy means great things for their for, for their people, specifically in India. We know they're. We know they've been we they've been called out a bunch for continuing to buy Russian oil. They're just doing exactly what they should be doing for their people. Exactly. And and let me ask you this: Do you think that if the price is there, and uh, you think coal mining is uh, clean from the standpoint of uh, no emissions, I have a feeling that they will still take Pennsylvania coal all over the world. I bet it'll still be exporting. No, absolutely. So, all right, let's wander on to the next one. Shout out to uh, Irina. She did a great job yes. on that one. Here's This one's near and dear to my heart, Michael. Environmentalists ignore renewables waste. This one drives me nuts. Uh, the farmland and landowners are getting it in the drive through all the time, and this is just making it nuts. This was actually out of uh, the Mid, uh, Midland Odessa newspaper. And here's a couple of really good quotes in here. 
Um, it's noteworthy that so many environmental activists fail to account for the waste streams associated with wind and solar power generation, overlooking the holistical and environmental impact of their overall technology, said Landgraf Odessa Republican, who chairs the Texas House Environmental Regulation Committee in Austin. Hey, I'd love to visit with you on the podcast there. Uh, they fail to recognize embracing renewable energy also necessitates confronting uh, company waste challenges head on. However, from a hindrance, these challenges can offer fertile ground for innovation. I couldn't agree more. Um, let's figure out how to get these things renewable, but it's the reclamation, land reclamation that nobody is talking about, yep. and the landowners are getting screwed. Yeah, in, in, in the mining business, specifically in the United States, I'm not going to speak for abroad. In the mining business, we figured out reclamation, and it's one of the reasons why permitting and getting in a, and getting mines approved in the United States takes a lot of money and a lot of time because a lot of that money goes towards reclamation. And a lot of the permitting required is how are you going to clean this site up when it's done? If there's only a 10-year mine life cycle, what are you going to do for the next That's 20 missing years in the wind afterwards? industry, Michael. What? That is missing in the wind industry right now. No, it's missing everywhere. So what I'm saying yeah. is this needs to come everywhere. We figured it out in the mining business. Why oh, yeah. can't we figure it out elsewhere? I, I agree. Because now these the, all this farmland that we're going to need mm -hmm. ain't going to be farming. No. Well, and, you know, I love the, the, the pick, the cover art here. You've got a, a drilling rig and a wind farm right next to each other. Um, again, we figured out a lot of this stuff with mining and oil and gas. It's going to be interesting how it works. I love this quote um, here in the article. The oil and gas industry's adapt uh, ad adaptability serves as evidence of this potential as it has effectively converted waste into a profitable income stream to fulfill market needs. That's according to uh, um, our friend, what's his name, do, 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 State Representative Brooks Landgraf, who is kind of spearheading, as you said, this, this charge. It, again, it's clear wind and solar are being backed by people who don't necessarily care about the environment. What they care about is the taking back what they see as control from the greedy oil and gas companies. Exactly. And I, I personally, uh, it, it's all about electrification and uh, everything else. So, hey, let's run on to ban on russian uranium helps build nuclear fuel capacity official says when do you what do you think my my official opinion of our us officials ability to get anything done correctly is michael slim is, to none absolutely the us passed legislation on tuesday that bans the import from russia the latest move to disrupt Putin's ability to pay for the full-scale invasion. They are dopes. The reality is the last few years has been a uh, the real and present possibility that Russia could stop abruptly sending enriched uranium to the United States. We get, I believe, 20% um, of our uh, enriched uranium from them. Holtec got 1.5 billion DOE loan in March, will have to refurbish their plant and get approval from US reg uh, regulators. Huff says, I fully expect it will operate better than it will operating once they get completed on those refurbishments. Holtec spokesperson Patrick O'Brien said, which still needs reauthorization, will undergo thorough inspections before any restart. I have absolutely zero confidence in this getting done. Well, and it shows you how interconnected the world is. Even in the midst of this war with Ukraine, we're still importing, you know, 24% of our enriched uranium used by reactors <laughs> in the United States from Russia. So absolutely. And I, I, it is absolutely despicable, Michael, because it's, it, uh, LNG, uh, Russia has figured out how to get around, <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. sanctions on oil. Yep. What is happening now is they are arranging for new, uh, there is a 
gut or a uh, a opening up, Michael. You're you're gonna flip out when you hear this one. I know you're about to yawn because you're like going, "Oh no, this is terrible." The dark fleet for LNG tankers is now started. You're going, oh no, another dark fleet for Stuart to talk about. Guess what? LNG is now going to be available to be bypassing sanctions. What else is going to be able to be bypassed in sanctions? Well, yeah. everything. I mean, hey, I you would be proud. On one of my solo shows last week, I talked about there was a specific article covering the dark fleet. There's about 500 vessels out there that are floating around. So you, you'd be proud. I mean, you, you've beaten me down on that enough. It, it all comes back to the world is so much more interconnected than we think. We say one thing over here with our hands, and then we have yes. our other hand up here saying something different. So I'm with you. I have little to no faith that this execution will be good. The only good thing that could come out of this is, is investment into the nuclear business. They in the U.S. nuclear business. They say it would unlock about yes, two point seven absolutely. billion in nuclear funding if this happens. That I'm for. I'm all in on that. But you know what? The regulatory process for holding up uh, nuclear facilities and everything else is still broken. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Off to you now, man. All right, well, before we jump to the finance segment, guys, we'll pay the bills here. As always, thanks for checking out the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis you heard and are about to hear is brought to you by that website. You can also check us out um, in the description below for all of the links to the articles, timestamps, everything you need to know um, to keep up to speed with the oil and gas business. You can check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Again, www.energynewsbeat.com. You know, pretty, pretty interesting. You know, I would say, you know, on Friday, I think everybody saw oil was down to about $78. We're currently sitting at at $78.11 as markets are about to open here. We'll, we'll, and we'll probably open down. It looks like we'll open down a little bit below 77 or a little bit below $78 at $77.90. So you'll hear that as you guys are listening to this um, on your commute Monday morning. We did see overall markets, though, on Friday um, jump 1.26 percentage points. NASDAQ up 1.9 percentage points. It, it, very interesting. You know, weak job numbers, market goes up because maybe they expect maybe a rate cut coming up. The problem is we had bad, we had higher than expected inflation, which means rates may not go anywhere. A little bit interesting to see where the market is is kind of pegging all this but we do know that specifically when we look at where uh the, the you know with this slowdown and what the U in what this data is showing is a possible slowdown in the US economy which means rate cuts either are intimate or not but what that does mean is that demand for energy products could slightly be lower than expected that's mainly what's causing oil to settle here i mean we're down now you know our steepest weekly loss in three months. Again, mainly off that U.S. jobs data. As I said, 78.11 for crude oil. Brent oil's 83.17. We also see natural gas up about 5.26 percentage points, $2.40 and, and, uh, and uh, 14 cents, which is actually um, first time it's been above $2 in, uh, you know, it's, it's been above $2 for a couple days now, but really it has, we haven't seen $2 really this year, which is absolutely great. Um, natural gas spiked mainly due to the fact that um, we saw um, a reduction in storage surplus based upon the five-year average, which we saw come out on Thursday. And we also are, you know, weather as things get hotter this summer, we will see an increase in oil and gas prices as we move from um, injection to drawing. Um, another, another thing we saw, and we can go ahead and throw this graphic up here, U.S. rig counts drop eight rigs week over week. Canada increased two. Internationally, we increased seven. U.S., though, still down 143 rigs relative to where we were last year. This is pretty unbelievable. I mean, I've been of the mindset that as oil prices, I mean, we're, we're, we've fallen over the past three weeks, but as we hover around that $75 to $85 mark, rigs are going to – it was my assumption that rigs were going to eventually go up. People are going to respond to incentives. Higher oil prices means rig counts should go up. We haven't seen that. This is four straight weeks of rig count lo losses, and I'm having a hard time, you know, pegging the reason for that. I, I think a lot of it is the pessimism among 
the long term cyclical cycle of the oil field. And and you know, not to say that this is a forecasting of, you know, there's no there's no there's no oil left to drill. That's that's a lie. The problem is it's a question of where do investors and where do companies see growth coming from? Do they see growth from coming from new investments in drilling? Or do they see investments in mergers and acquisitions as a way to grow their company? And that's a little bit of a tee up to what Exxon and Pioneer uh, happened, but I, I th- it's it's a little confusing. And I, I don't want to pretend to, you know, I just want to sit up here and blow me about why I think, um, you know, why I think this is the case. Again, rig counts being down. It, it, there, there's only a, there's only a couple answers though, and you know what what that is. Who knows? Um, let's let's. Let's talk about Exxon closing its Pioneer deal, but but mainly it's the FTC forcing Sheffield not to be on the board. So let's go ahead and 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 read the, the the top headline here. I'm reading from the article. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission declined to challenge Exxon Mobil's sixty billion dollar purchase of Pioneer Natural Resources, but in allowing that to go through, asserted that Scott Sheffield, Pioneer's CEO and co-founder, must not take a seat on the super majors board. Interesting. The decision, the decision which was announced Thursday, quote unquote, will ease concern that the Biden administration will seek to block a series of oil and gas mega mergers, but it came at a hefty price. Here's the quote from Deputy Director of the FTC Bureau of Competition, Kyle Mock. He said, Mr. Sheffield's past conduct makes it crystal clear that he should be nowhere near Exxon's boardroom. American consumers shouldn't pay unfair prices at the pump simply to pad corporate executives. Uh, pocketbooks. Unbelievable, Stu. So what's the FTC claiming here in blocking Scott Schiff? We're going to get into this in a little bit because this has got me fired I'm up a little up bit. about this one. I, the, so F- the FTC says it will, or, the order will prevent Sheffield from engaging in, quote, collusive activity that could drive up crude oil prices and force U.S. consumers to pay higher fuel prices. The agency said he exchanged hundreds of text messages with OPEC representatives and officials about the oil market. Wait a second. The CEO of a major oil company is exchanging text messages with other CEOs and heads of major oil and ga- gas companies. Color me shocked. Absolutely unbelievable. We're going to move over here to, um, you know, Linda Khan. Unbelievable. She's the head of the FTC here. She has a Twitter thread that I want to read a little bit about. So she, she's got six points here. We'll list this in the in the description below. But, but she says the FTC's investigation into the Exxon Pioneer deal revealed an elaborate campaign by Pioneer CEO Scott Sheffield to collude with OPEC officials and inflate oil prices. The same guy who was saying... Who, the same guy who was in charge when oil prices were negative $37. Just, just remember that. Just remember that. Tweet number two. Global oil production has long been dominated by the OPEC cartel. Still dominated by the OPEC cartel. If OPEC cuts productions, Americas can get hit with high gas prices. Just a fundamental misunderstanding of how gas prices work. But that's okay. U.S. production in the Permian Basin has emerged as a potential check on OPEC. But Sheffield has been trying to collude with OPEC rather than compete. Now this is where it gets interesting, okay? They're going to they're gonna pop up some of these images. Sheffield has routinely made public comments, public, which I, I find that hilarious, but we're now holding public comments against him, signaling to rivals that they should, quote, stay in line and reduce output over text messages and private dinners. Now we're looking at text messages in terms of mergers and acquisitions, but over text messages and private dinners, he has also stayed in close contact with top officials from OPEC to coordinate on cutting back production. FTC's orders bans Sheffield from serving on the Exxon board or serving um, um, in any advisory capacity. Listen to this. This is what I think the, the absolute most is able. The order also prohibits Exxon for five years from nominating or designating any pioneer employees or directors um, to the Exxon board with limited in with limited inceptions. And this all goes back to, again, some private text messages that Sheffield sent attempt, you know, in which they're trying to garner the idea that he is trying to lower oil and gas production in order to raise prices at the pump. Wait, wait, lowering oil and gas production actually does lower profits a little bit. How do you make money? You make money by selling oil and gas. This completely swings at miss. This is this is a a lawyer attempting to spin what the underlying is assumption. And let's go back. Why was Scott Sheffield from 2016 or really 2017 
through his purchase, the his selling to Pioneer. Why was he screaming at the top of his lungs, both publicly and privately? So you can't say he's he's talking in one mouth and saying something over here. He's saying everything in the same period over. He, he's saying everything in public and private. Why is it, why is he talking about lowering oil production? It's all about investors. Go back to what we talk about the incentives. Okay, so the, the, you know they have like over forty different points they put in this FTC thing. Point number twenty seven. Okay. One move in Sheffield's playbook has involved publicly threatening U.S. shale producers who might deviate from a coordinated reduction scheme. For example, in 2021, okay, this is when oil was like, what, 30 bucks, 40 bucks? Sheffield said everyone's going to be disciplined regardless of whether it's 75, 80, or 100. He added, all shareholders that I've talked to said that if anybody goes back to growth, they will punish those companies. Is that threatening, Stu? Is that a threat? No, he was leading the cotton picking charge for following up and saying, I'm going to give money back to the shareholders. He's being a great CEO. Well, again, what is the what is the 30,000 foot overhang from this from his comments? He was part of the 20, 2008 to 2016 mode where. There was no regard for oil prices. There was exactly. drill, baby, drill. Invest capital. Produce as much oil as possible. To, to what? Raise oil prices? Was was that what he was doing in those eight years prior to this? No. What happened was there was an absolute value destruction of oil and gas valuations because of that. Nobody made money in the oil and gas business. Investors pulled out. So what is he saying? Pioneer is going to be okay regardless. And he said this multiple times that Pioneer is going to be okay regardless of whether or not oil prices go. What he's saying is if you run an oil company and you are not focused on return and your shareholders, which the, the the whims of shareholders change all the time. It used to be growth. Now it's cash flow. We see the big business. Amazon was able to run negative profit margins for years and get rewarded by that. Why? Because it's what the shareholders wanted. Then all of a sudden they moved to profit. And guess what? Shareholders realized they wanted profit. So it's unbelievable okay it's unbelievable he again he, he also says he also says you know they say quote 30 in fact as recently as april 16th 2024 mr sheffield said in a conference even if oil goes to 200 about independent producers are going to be dismal well yeah because they like they need access to capital markets they need access to capital markets. they also go on to say that he had these secret dinners with opec where they were you know Attempting to collude. It's unbelievable. This is this is I, a way and a political. I'm throwing my pens because I'm so mad. This is a political witch hunt in order to, hey, we know we can't find legal grounds to block this merger, but what we can do is signal to our base that we are attempting to help with oil prices. Wait, I I thought the US government couldn't do anything about gas prices. I thought the government couldn't do anything. I thought they, I thought nobody they can do things with gas, gas prices. Price so money. why they all can of a sudden raid the SPR? Capital? They raid the SPR. Absolutely. Oh, this gets me fired up. This uh, is unbelievable. And you know who gets hurt hurts the worst on this and this is more inside baseball. Pioneer employees get hurt by this. Exactly. They had only one they they only had one person looking out for them on the Exxon board and that was going to be Scott Sheffield. Now, all of a sudden, they're going to be integrated to the Exxon machine. And, and you know what? They're going to be seen as disposable in a few years. And that's just, there's no one to back them up on the board because guess what? You, the FTC blocked any representation for five years of Pioneer employees, or original Pioneer employees on the board. This is unbelievable. Sheffield has got con. Shame on the FTC. Shame on Linda Kahn in order for making this happen, for being motivated by political points rather than actual public, and not public, but actual strong facts. It's unbelievable. What do you think, Stu? I want an attorney to reach out and get a hold of um, Sheffield and, and go after this person legally. This is defamation at the highest level, as far as I'm concerned. This is despicable. Yeah, it. I have I mean, other things, but I don't want to get thrown off of Google for something like this. <laughs> well, it. I, I think despicable. the issue I, again. I think what they 
what they what they gambled was that Scott Sheffield's made his money. Scott Sheffield is independently wealthy. That if this this theoretical, you know, this not proxy move, but this this signaling that we're going to stop this, we're going to stop somebody who's colluding for low oil prices and keep him off the Exxon board is somehow going to, you know, satisfy our political base, but actual allowing these mergers to go through, which is. It's 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 like what they did for Obamacare. Oh, well, it's you know, it's the sleight of hand where remember the the, the Obamacare debate when um, Chief Justice Roberts eventually okayed it by saying, well, it's technically a tax and Congress has a right to tax. So sure, it's through. Well, that's a, just a hand waving an attempt to satisfy both parties. And again, this is what this is where politicians get themselves in trouble. They try to thread the needle so that everybody likes them. And guess what? Nobody likes them. Democrats on the other side said, why would you let this go through? You know, Republicans and people in the oil and gas business are like, you're an absolute idiot. If you actually believe that you think Scott Sheffield was, if he was in control of $100 oil, well, he was also in control of negative $37 oil. So are you going to thank him then? Are you going to thank him for that? Unbelievable. I I mean, you got any more on this? Too? I, like I said, we're going to, you know, we're going to. We're going to go ahead and, and curtail this, but I guarantee you, I hope it comes out. And I hope that person loses their job as a political hack. Yeah, it's it's this this was tough. Um, this was tough. I, I you know it's well, well we'll move on. But you know Sheffield he got conned for sure. Um, let's just finish up with with EOG. Um, we had a lot of earnings that happened last week. A lot of earnings that are going to come up this week. You know, again, we're only going to. And you know you can go to energynewsbeat.com. We'll have all of the earnings releases. I just like to pick out one or two that I think show some interesting stuff. And you know to go back to our rig count. Rig counts are down year over year, even though we've seen oil prices increase year over year. Well, things I like to look at are large companies, capex versus crude oil production increases. Because theoretically, if capital is being spent, we should see production increases, right? Okay. So it's one of the things I like to look at, but, but, but let's first look at their, their, their first quarter highlights. EOG earned an adjusted net income of about $1.6 billion or about $2 and 82 cents per share generated about $1.2 billion of free cash flow. declared a regular quarterly dividend about 91 cents a share. They've paid now in 2020 uh, in the first quarter, they paid about $525 million in regular dividends and repurchased about $750 million shares during the first quarter. Um, volumes and total per cash operating costs better than guidance midpoints. Um, wellhead volumes um, in Q1 of 2024 was about 487,000 barrels of crude oil per day. Uh, natural gas uh, liquids were up about uh, we're up about 4,000 uh, 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 barrels per day and natural gas up about 50. But for that, for a 1,000 barrel a day increase, okay, or excuse me, a 2,000 barrel increase per day, Stu, CapEx wow. expenditures of $1.7 billion. Woo! Woo! Okay. Hmm. Go back to why are rig counts lower. If anything's a signal of why rig counts are lower, in my opinion, this is an example of it. 2,000 barrels a day, and you get $1.7 billion? Stu, I'd like that budget. I know we said this last quarter about EOG. I would like that budget. I would really like that budget. Going back to um, um, 2023, they've only increased it, um, you know, what is it? Four, five, 5,000 barrels a day? They've spent like... Four ish billion dollars on capex. Now, a lot of that is long tail. A lot of that is doesn't necessarily wrap itself up. But it goes to show you that we're going to continue to spend capex dollars, and the amount of oil we're making per dollar invested is actually going down. And that could be the signal within the noise of what's going on with oil prices, or excuse me, rig counts specifically. And there's just not enough efficient barrels to go get. And unless we see 100, 150, $200 oil, then we see those big explosions of production. But pretty, pretty fascinating um, um, from EOG. They, you know, of, of course, they're going to have a, a great quote. Ezra Jacob, who's the chairman and CEO, 
you know, EOG is off to a great start this year, delivering strong first quarter results. Production exceeded targets and total per unit operating costs were lower than planned. Um, you know, again, they're doing a lot of exploration, specifically in the Utica. Um, you know, the they're one of the better oil and gas companies when it comes to exploration. They're one of the few companies that actually do old school, traditional exploration. But it goes to show you $1.7 billion of CapEx gives you about 2,000 barrels a day if you're EOG. Pretty crazy, Stu. Uh, yep. So um, what, what, what else? What did we forget, Stu? Well, uh, the earnings, one of the earnings uh, on Newsbeat is from uh, Vesta's share fall after posting earnings loss, revenues decline. This is another one, just a, a manufacturers uh, all through the world. Uh, Vesta's first quarter uh, adjusted to EBITDA uh, came in at a negative uh, 68 euro a million. Uh, they're 5.2 below the uh, 2.3 billion reported. So you sit back and take a look. All them wind farm folks and solar panel folks are just taking it in the drive-through because subsidies are running out. Yeah, we know. <laughs> we could have figured that. Um, what should we be worried about this week? Um, don't go to college. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just you might want to erase that Columbia. Um, if you got Columbia on your resume, you might want to scratch that off. Oh no, what a bunch of chatterheads! I do have to give a shout out. I I, I thoroughly enjoyed the three uh, podcasters walk into a bar. We had uh, Doctor uh, uh, Stanley Ridgely on there, and it was a hoot. Mm -hmm. So we we talked about it. You got to have a fun podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, guys, we'll let you get out of here. Start your day. Appreciate you guys checking us out. World greatest podcast, Energy News Beat. Check us out online again, www.energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.